Jason Schreiber. He's founder and CEO of Six Arms. And I'm going to give Jason control over the slides. Jason, floor is yours. Good morning. And uh, yeah, once again, thank you very much for, for having me on your IEEE um, BTS event. Very happy to be here. Uh, I think it's 1.30 a.m., but I'm buzzing. I was so excited about Paul and um, Bill's presentation. Uh, pretty good, so I'm wide awake now, so I think we're, we're, we're good to roll. Um, what we are going to do, though, Paul, if you don't mind, I'm going to just unclip your thermal camera from your drone there, and I'm just going to pop on a, a spectrum analyzer, uh, an antenna, and some control software, and uh, you know, let's see what we can do with the drone by measuring some RF. Okay, just clicking on that slide. Um, in this third session, uh, I'm just going to present to you uh, a couple of ways that we have been using drones, uh, and and I'm going to use the word drone and not S SAUS or UAV or RPA or RPS or you know everyone's got a different acronym. It's a drone, right? Everyone understands what I'm talking about when I say a drone. So I'm just going to present a couple of ways which you know we currently are using drones to measure RF. Um, and I always normally start out with this this picture uh, right here, which is of uh, 2014 uh, when we came up with the idea and we, we literally strapped equipment onto a drone, flew it up in the air. It was uh, pretty monstrous, uh, monst uh, like Frankenstein looking, but you know, we got a signal, we proved the theory and uh, you know, we've, we've gone from there. So the current applications that we, we're using this uh, RF measurement drone for are um, basically four categories, um, really three categories. Um, we can combine two of them together, but the main one being your antenna pattern verification. So that's your, your, your uh, antenna on the top of the tower. It's radiating your FM radio signal, your, your TV signal, uh, whatever it is. You know, knowing your antenna pattern is kind of the gold, you know, that's like, Everyone strives to know exactly what what their pattern is doing because that kind of gives you the basis for um, analyzing everything else on your system. If you've got haven't got a good pattern, you don't have a good signal, you don't have good viewership. Uh, and talking about viewership, we then can then actually send the drone into the field, uh, and we can do you know desktop based coverage predictions, and then we can include some drone based field measurements to confirm that uh, number three that our propagation model. Uh, the tuning, uh, the, clutter the clutter data tuning, um, the propagation method, uh, the diffraction model, all of that stuff we can fine tune now with real data from the field we've gathered from the drone. And the final um, area that we've, we've been using drones is also, you know, internal manufacturers can use them. They can speed up their R&D time. Um, and, uh, you know, they can perform uh, antenna tests in the factory pretty much. Before we get into those, the, the kind of ways that the drones are using, uh, that we're gathering the, the, the field data, it's probably good to, to kind of uh, recognize the, the old ways, or not, I'm not going to say the old, well, the traditional ways of, of measuring that data. Um, so we've got here yeah, vehicle based techniques with a 30 foot pump up mast, uh, and they, they're used for kind of coverage measurements. You do spot measurements with them. They do take a bit of time to set up. Um, that just reminds me of a, a measurement uh, we did a couple of months ago with with a US uh, uh, client, and um, they did it the old way. I'm going to say old. I don't mean old. I mean traditional way. Um, they did this pump up mast method, and to be honest, by the time he had got his pump up mast out of the truck, we had already done the drone measurement and packed up, and we're ready to leave. Uh, so you know, we we kind of just. Uh, the speed and efficiency of, of an automated drone based system is just, uh, um, you know, it, it just saves time. Uh, with this, with the old, with the traditional methods, um, you know, we're kind of limited to 30 feet. Uh, it's difficult to actually diagnose an antenna pattern by doing uh, measurements with a vehicle uh, because you just, you just uh, swamped with multipath. Uh, you can't get clean signals. You have to have line of sight all the time. Uh, you need you need a number of points to be able to get a 360 degree pattern. Uh, so extremely difficult. Um, you can move up to a, a helicopter based approach, um, which is you know still to this, this day is, is very valid. 
uh, in some cases we cannot fly a drone in, a, in an urban environment. Think of New York City, you know, it's going to be extremely difficult to do that. Uh, so we can still use uh, the, the helicopter based method. Uh, the one the one thing that's kind of um, stopping us from getting really highly accurate data is the ability of that pilot to fly a fixed flight path, I guess. You know, so we've got slightly less accuracy than than a drone based system, but still very valid and a technique used uh, to this day. Um, with the drone based system, everything's uh, autonomous and automated. And I do apologise, I'm going to use the word automated a lot because uh, the drone based system just allows for everything to be done for you, for that automation to be happening. Uh, we can actually clear uh, the, the local clutter and we can get above all the tree lines and so we can get into kind of a free space, in, free space environment which eventually helps us to tune our, our propagation models. So let's uh, flick straight over and uh, you know let's get to the gold which is uh, our antenna pattern verification and just a quick recap for those uh, you know who haven't looked at this for a while is that uh, your antenna pattern is kind of divided into two kind of main areas. One is an azimuth pattern and that's if you have to kind of chop your antenna in half you know where is that signal radiating uh, where is where is it going uh, and then the elevation pattern was if you could take a slice down the side of your antenna uh, you know, to figure out, well, where is that antenna pointing? You know, am I shooting it up at the sky? Am I pointing it down to uh, to the actual coverage area I'm looking at um, I'm covering? So it's very important to know that, uh, you know, your antenna pattern is, it's purposely designed, right? So it's designed to hit your population area. You want to get your TV signal to the right population or your radio signal. Uh, you also have perhaps some FCC interference uh, issues, so yeah, it can only radiate in certain directions. You need to be compliant, you can't overpower it. Um, so there's a whole bunch of uh, parameters which go into the makeup of exactly what your antenna pattern looks like. But these two patterns themselves allow for your coverage predictions to be done. They're, kind of, they're the gold, once again, I refer, refer to them as. Um, just a quick cap recap on the on the on the actual plots. Um, so the red the data in all these plots, the red uh, dash data is um, uh, is the manufacturer's supplied data. So that's the design, that's the ideal. Whereas the black line is normally the drone based uh, systems uh, measured data. Um, the the impact of not having your measured data match up to your design uh, data is that you know you've lost your signal in a potentially uh, lucrative market uh, you know you're losing revenue at the end of the day um, so let's keep talking about uh, the airborne antenna pattern verification process look it's not it's it's we're not reinventing the wheel here there are existing ITU uh, recommendations on how to carry out an airborne based antenna pattern measurement. They are geared towards a helicopter, which does, you know, uh, a, 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 the drone based, we, we looked at the RTU recommendations, we've built on them, we've improved them for a drone based scenario. Uh, we've added the ability to automate the logging, automate the flight path um, uh, creation, automate uh, and control the drone position data. Uh, everything is you know, again, automated. Automated is, is the key to kind of having a successful RF uh, measurement drone. And this allows us to minimize those uh, user errors in the field. You know, you don't have to write down the values anymore. You don't have to see what it was at five meters, at 10 meters, uh, sorry, uh, 15 feet, 30 feet for my American people. Um, on the right hand side there, when I talk about automation, uh, we've got this is this as soon as the drone lands this is what is produced you know we, we've got the data right there the data is presentable to the to the to the user as soon as the drone has finished its measurement tasks so we've got the elevation data uh, and we've got the azimuth data uh, we've got the parameters even uh, that we use to set up that spectrum analyzer uh, we have the receiver calibration factors so it's now an auditable an auditable trail uh, you know 
there's actually some science to what we're doing in the background and that's all kind of logged so we can always audit the data that we uh, we use to create a, a measurement set okay let's click on to the next one so this is i guess uh the why why would we want to be doing antenna pattern measurements you know uh, what what's the gain in doing them and I guess I've got three real life examples here of, of antennas that we have measured before. Uh, and, and this is drone based measurements. Um, and, and the three examples here are, you know, the location of that antenna. If, if you're putting your transmit antenna, uh, you know, on the side mount of a, of a structure uh, and you're getting a, perhaps a, a omnidirectional um, reference pattern from a manufacturer, uh, you have to think about that a little bit because if you're putting your antenna on the side of a structure, you're going to get some um, interaction between the signal and the structure. So we're going to get some ripple. Uh, the extent of that ripple is not going to be known. The only way you can figure out where you've got your nulls or where you've got your extra peaks is by doing this antenna pattern measurement. And so on the left hand side, uh, this is a typical side mount antenna. Uh, the reference pattern says it should be reasonably omnidirectional. Uh, the measured pattern is now telling us something that resembles a bit of an omnidirectional pattern, but with some caveats. We have a huge notch here at the 45 degree uh, northeast segment, you know, and that notch could be up to uh, potentially six to eight dB. And, and that in terms of power is almost three quarters of your power is lost in that direction. So if your main uh, target area was in that direction, you know, I would be a little bit um, worried that my antenna is not operating as, it, as I wanted it to. Uh, so those are some structural effects that can affect your antenna pattern. Um, the middle antenna uh, plot is based on an FM antenna measurement. Uh, and just bearing in mind, I guess this whole drone based uh, measurement system can be used over, you know, the whole broadcasting range. You know, we go down as low as VLF broadcasting, 200 kilohertz. Uh, we can go up to AM radio broadcasting. We can do FM radio. Uh, it can be used for HD radio, DAB radio. Uh, you know, so it's the full spectrum, TV, uh, ATSC, ATC3, DVB-T, the underlying technology is still the same to create, to measure your, your antenna pattern with a, with a drone-based solution. So this middle, this middle antenna, uh, if you have a look at its reference pattern, the red one, you know, you can see that it should uh, have some signal towards the northwest and the north, but it's suffering from something. And it's probably suffering from an antenna phasing issue in the panels, uh, which are, are incorrectly installed um uh, all the phasing has been incorrectly uh, accounted for and then the, the the third one is interesting that's a slotted a slot slotted uhf tv antenna um and if you have a look at once again you have a look at the design uh the red dotted line you know the the broadcaster obviously wanted to cover the area in the in the west uh towards the west uh and the pattern that they've got once we measured it uh, is showing a a, you know, it's a beautiful null, but it's a null in the area that they wanted to uh, to cover their population, and, and so that could be of of concern. And you know, that that may be a manufactured defect. So it actually came out of the factory that way. The install the installed guys actually didn't potentially didn't do anything um, uh, to, to to warrant that that notch. Uh, the interesting thing there is you see two two dark lines and. Those are, that means two measured patterns. So this antenna has been measured twice. Uh, and the really interesting thing is they've been measured twice over a period of two and a half years. So back in the early 2018, we measured that antenna. Uh, we found it to, to have, exhibit this antenna pattern. And just uh, you know, last year, we went back in 2020 and we measured it again with a different, a different drone, a different receive antenna, different parameters, but ultimately the same RF uh, airborne measurement system, and we got results that are uh, are uh, you know really repeatable, which is you know that is one if you're setting up a drone-based RF measurement system, you want the results to be repeatable. So that's a rate a very big plus on the the drone-based um, measurement side of of, our, of RF. Okay, so we've done the whys uh, in a couple of examples of the whys, but 
this is uh, the how. How are, we, how are we doing this? How are we doing the automated flight path generation? How are we doing the automated RF data gathering? How are we doing the automated RF reports? And so I've got a, a, a video to play next, which is, uh, and full disclaimer, I think I've made it, I've sped it up a bit too much. I tried to shorten it by, by speeding it up, um, uh, not a lot, but um, if you can just not start that one just uh, yet, Joel. Um, and this is gonna show us a, uh, once it does start, not yet, it's gonna show us some elevation patterns. This is actually of a real measurement session uh, that we conducted. Uh, it's going to show us the four elevation patterns done in one flight, so which would usually take 25 minutes. Uh, it's going to show us how the data is collected. It's going to do an orbit flight, uh, show us the data collected, just so we can get a, a sense of what the drone is doing to gather this data. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, switch myself off and we can uh, start that uh, video, Joel. Okay, it's gonna be pretty speedy, but you can see that the drone is now flying to its first location. It's doing its first elevation flight. So it's always maintaining uh, the right appropriate distance. It's now flying to a second elevation flight. This is 2000 feet away from the antenna of interest. And now we've just measured the second elevation. And th this, this, uh, this flight path will do four elevations. Um, and this this is a real a real measurement campaign that we we were involved in. And the last phase, uh, we do a zigzag pattern just to save battery. And you know we can do this flight is probably 28 minutes long in real time, but uh, for you probably about 20 seconds. But gives you an indication of the, of a real flight. And this is the data that we're looking at. The user is actually seeing this data live on their screen. The red data is the invalid data. The drone is traveling to its position, its start position. It's turned around, it's got us to its start position. It's now slowly climbing in elevation. And as we climb in elevation, we hit the peaks and there's our main beam just there. So we know exactly where it's pointing. Uh, and then it keeps climbing to get more data. And then it goes red once it's traveling to the next, uh, next point. This is now an orbit flight. So same distance, 2000 feet. It takes off, flies to the starting point turns around, faces the uh, antenna of interest, uh, starts its, um, its orbit uh, 2,000 feet exactly away from the tower at exact height of that main beam that we're interested in, and it performs a perfect circle. No pilot can fly a helicopter that straight. Uh, so this is one of the advantages of the drone-based system and technology as well. It will then get to the end, and it comes back down to the start location. What this looks like in the data gathering process, oops, I skipped a bit forward. This is the drone's view, just a little camera to show you, hey, this is what I'm looking at. Uh, the center of the tower, uh, always, always in the center. Uh, this is sped up significantly as well, but there's just a, a view of what the, the drone looks at when it does a measurement. And then we should see in a second, um, the data. So it's dro the drone's flown to its uh, start position. The user is looking at this live and we're actually measuring and looking at the real RF data in ERP, so radiated power uh, coming through. Our drone has changed into an F-16 fighter, um, but uh, you know, it should change back to a drone anytime soon. Okay. All right, we can flick back to the slides. Thank you very much, Joel. And I think I'm back in control. Um, and I'll put my video back on. I think, perfect, great. So that was the antenna pattern side of things. Now let's just look at the coverage field strength studies. Now, uh, I'm sure most of you may be familiar with the beautiful colored contour um, picture that you're seeing there, the map. Uh, so that's created by some sort of desktop study, uh, some theoretical models, and it gives you the, the, the field contours. Uh, we do coverage field strength surveys as a combination normally of the desktop study as well as some in-field measurements, whether they're vehicle-based or, or now can be drone-based, uh, to give us an idea of exactly what is the reach of our signal. We can now validate the prediction with the, uh, the drone-based measurement system, uh, and we can confirm loca uh, our actual signal strength at uh, you know, clients' key locations or um, areas of interest. 
So drone-based coverage field strength studies. Um, they, they, once again, we're not reinventing the wheel here. They're based on ITU or FCC guidelines um, for field strength measurements. Uh, the only thing with the drone is now we can automate it and we can get, I guess, more data. We can gather data all the way up to 90 feet. We can go higher if we want to. Um, the plot on the left-hand side is, is a measurement of four uh, TV stations all done at once. The y-axis is the altitude from takeoff and the x-axis is the field strength intensity. Uh, you can see that blue hashed line is the limiting factor of a, a vehicle-based system these days. You can only go up to 30 feet. And so they're, they're, they're picking up a lot of this uh, multi-path and, and, and layering uh, and diffraction. Uh, whereas if we start climbing into the uh, more the free space type model, uh, you know, you can see that the signal climbs uh, and is less prone to um, any kind of um, uh, multi-path issues. So I guess data is king. We can we can collect so much more data, and that data can now be backfed into our algorithms. It can be backfed into your prediction model. It can be backfed into your Longley Longley Rice uh, coverage software. Uh, you know we can start to optimize um, clutter. You know we can start to optimize the diffraction models. Uh, in the end, we're just getting better models, uh, which we can rely on. Um, rely on more, I guess, uh, you know, to determine where our coverage is going. So the, the drone-based system allows for mass automation. It allows for mass veri verification of coverage because you've, we've taken the RF engineer out of the field measurements and we've put him into a, a software component. This is now just another way of visualizing the data. Um, now, because we have this great geospatial data, we can create great looking data sets. And what we've done here is I'm just showing you three measurement locations uh, and, and uh, two different techniques of how we can get the field strength. You know, whether you use a single measurement from zero feet to 30 feet, or whether you use a five point method like these two on the right, or whether you use a method where you go up to 30 feet vertically and you go 100 feet horizontally, uh, you know, you, 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 choose the mo you choose the method that you want to use. The good thing is about the drone-based uh, field strength measurements is that whole process is now automated. We can literally take off, push the play button on the drone controller. It will fly to those five points, fly up, fly down, fly up, fly down. And in, you know, three or four minutes, you'll have that data. It is logged. It is processed into a report style template and you can use it straight away. Uh, there's no, there's no sitting at, uh, uh, there's no post-processing needed. You don't have to sit and crunch numbers. Uh, it's all done for you. Uh, so we've got some really cool visualizations and you can see the lower we are to the ground, the less the signal is. And as we clear, you know, the ground obstacle, uh, the ground kind of um, clutter, we get a nice blue consistent signal. So that one on the far right, uh, you know, we've done it five, we've done the same measurement five times in, in a one single location. And you can see that they're really, really consistent in terms of, of field intensity. Uh, the middle one, you can see that uh, as we're going up, uh, we're getting a little bit of, you know, the signal you know, fades and comes back. And, and, and it's quite kind of consistent out of all five of those. Um, uh, you'd, you'd process to process this. Uh, it, well, sorry, you don't process it. The the average of those five is then taken as your representative field strength for this location. In the background there, in the distance on the horizon, you can notice that that's actually where our antenna is. Uh, so this whole data set is being dumped into a geospatial tool that you can now plot. Uh, you know, if you've done 20 of these locations around your area, you can now go and have a look at it and see well what what's uh, what's my What's my field strength look at uh, look look like? And you overlay your um, prediction on top of this. Um, the last use case, I guess, is um, you know antenna manufacturers um, with a with a drone-based RF measurement solution. Uh, I guess you can your speed to design a new antenna is a lot quicker. Uh, your R and D time is a lot shorter. Uh, you don't have to have an extensive test range anymore. You don't need to lift these things up on cranes and mount them, mount them to test them. Um, we can measure the full uh, antenna pattern. Um, we can get the full elevation pattern, which 
is hardly done anymore because of the size of these antennas. Um, there's less setup, more efficiency, uh, and once again, automated results. Uh, but here's, here's a good thing is that the correlation of these measurements to your electromagnetic modeling tools helps you define, helps you uh, optimize the electromagnetic tool, uh, you know, wh whether it's HFSS or uh, whatever you're using for your modeling, uh, you can now uh, correlate your, your measurements uh, to, your, to your design to, at the end of the day, give the client a better antenna. Okay, so what are these antenna systems, like what are these, these drone-based systems looking like? And uh, you know, what do they consist of? And uh, here's the thing, they varied. Every drone may have a specific use case. Um, uh, one thing is consistent in all of them though, you need a drone, uh, you need some receive antenna, you need a spectrum analyzer, you need the ability to control that spectrum analyzer, um, and you need the ability to control the positional data. That's what all of these drones have in common. Uh, what they don't have in common is that the one on the, uh, some of these are off the shelf, standard off the shelf drones, and some of these are custom. Um, the one in the top left there is measuring uh, UHF TV and FM radio or HD radio at the same time. Um, the one on the far right is the bigger one and it's measuring VLF broadcasting at 200 kilohertz. Um, hey, actually, I think we've got your, uh, your drone down here, Paul. Uh, it's the second to the, uh, on the bottom. Uh, that looks like your DJI Matrice 210. Uh, so it's got a FM antenna on it and it's measuring FM at this point. Uh, the little orange guy, he can measure AM radio um, and uh, a very portable and neat little little drone is, is, is the one on the far right, which is measuring UHF TV, um, but it's so small and compact that it, it you know, it, it, it's um, just, uh, helps with efficiency and getting measurements done and the full layering cycle up to you know, 90 feet. Okay, so why innovate in the space? Why create uh, these platforms uh, when we've got traditional ways of, of achieving you know, similar results? Um, well, here's the thing, we're, we're creating better resolution of data, we're creating more accurate data we're adding the bonus of automating the complete task. Uh, we have a greater, we can find, get a greater understanding of, of how your transmission system is actually operating, you know, and more importantly, we can fix it and optimize it so that you, you do get the coverage penetration you're looking for. You know, it's an opportunity here to, to help uh, improve antenna design. So from the antenna manufacturer point of view and speed up R&D, uh, there's the ability of repeatable measurements uh, you know, we're creating efficiency. We're going from weeks in the field to hours in the field, um, zero post-processing. Uh, and all of this, greater understanding of this data and is going to eventually allow for further innovation in the broadcast and media space um, because we have a better understanding of, of, of signals and, and the way that they propagate. However, we have to realize that uh, with any drone-based system, uh, with any innovative solution, uh, we have challenges, right? And this is by far not the only drone we've crashed. Um, we have FAA challenges. You know, most of the time we need an FAA waiver to fly. Uh, we're exposing a drone to really harsh RF environments. Uh, Industry acceptance of innovation. So, you know, the old saying, uh, oh, that's not how we do it. You know, that, that getting over that is, is tough. It's a challenge. Uh, you know, we're challenging previous antenna designs with real data. Some antenna manufacturers haven't even had their antenna patterns measured, right? And, and we're measuring them and we're giving them results which they've never seen before. Uh, and this one is really tough. It's deciding accountability. If we do, if this drone-based RF measurement system finds an issue, you know, who's hold accountable? I really do thank you, uh, REEE, for, for inviting me, and I thank you all for listening to that uh, the presentation. I'm, I'm definitely open to any questions that you may have. And we have a comment and a question. Uh, let's see. Um, first question comes from William. And William says, uh, a comment for Jason. 
We are engineers. We can work in metric. Just passing <laughs> that along. <laughs> Thanks, William. Yep, appreciate that. And let's see, uh, from Clarence. Uh, Jason, fascinating to see that you're recording field strength data from 30 foot elevation to 90 feet. Um, is this data something that you would be able to share in terms of correction factor for height relative to 30 feet for different frequencies for AM broadcast, FM broadcast, and a range of TV frequencies, or would this be considered proprietary? Uh, good to hear from you again, Clarence. Um, no, definitely, um, you know, I think we could definitely have a chat about that uh, offline. You know, the data uh, we gather above um, 30 feet, you know, we're trying to advance the, 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 the betterment, of, I guess, of, of the whole industry. So, you know, if that data is of use to you that you can um, um, use in, in, in special ways, yeah, we're, we're happy to share. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Robert has a question. Um, what sort of averaging and what parameters are used to produce the measured antenna patterns? Uh, thanks, Robert. Um, he, has, he has something you, you're probably not going to believe. Uh, for UHF TV, none. We don't need to do any averaging. For UHF TV, ATSC, um, uh, DVBT, uh, we don't need to do any sort of averaging. The, the data displayed is the data measured. So there's, there's no post-processing needed. That smooth pattern that you saw in the demo, that's the smooth pattern you measure. Very good, thank you. So at this time, I would like to invite all of our um, guests to uh, come back on the screen and um, uh, we will uh, enter our uh, roundtable discussion. And Doug did type in his question for Jason, so... Um, if uh, you all are okay with uh, taking that question, Jason, um, I will go ahead and um, ask his question. Are you okay? Yeah, no problem. Good. Um, Doug says, uh, having done helicopter measurements in 1989 with Dane Erickson using a topo map for uh, location determination and a Potomac Instruments test gear, uh, this is a major improvement. We've used six arms for a number of sites and amazed at the results. So, kudos. Thank you very much, Doug. And uh, yeah, we appreciate working with you. Very good. And now I'm going to turn off the uh, slide so that we can have our uh, roundtable. Floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Joel. And uh, thanks for to our presenters again for, for coming back here. I'd like to um, open this up to anybody who has any questions regarding um, any of the topics that we've discussed today. Um, uh, so feel free, don't be, don't be shy. Um, I'll kick things off, I guess, um, with one of the things that is um, very important to me and I'm sure important to other people that, that use drones, um, and that is drone safety. And I'd like to um, direct this question to Bill. Bill is a uh, instructor, of course, and he deals with um, people that are not familiar with drones quite a bit, and they've developed, uh, you know, uh, specific protocols for safety. So, Bill, would you comment a little bit on some of the precautions that you take? I know I was very impressed with the organization of the flight deck when we um, we did our training, and. Um, you know, for people that don't do this all the time, what are some of the things that are important to remember when you're dealing with something dangerous like a drone? Well, I think one of the most important things to remember is to know your area. Uh, we do what's called the 360. So we scan everything 360 degrees of where our mission is going to take place. Where are those guide wires? <laughs> where are those trees? What's the potential? that we could uh, injure the craft, or more importantly, where are our people on the site? Our flight deck is usually 12 feet in circumference, so if something does happen upon liftoff, our people are well and safe out of the way. So we have a specific protocol we follow, and uh, that protocol is addressed in a safety briefing. And uh, I just again wanna thank Paul, because uh, he was there and was able to operate the aircraft and we had our, our uh, training. And, uh, and uh, thank you again for the invitation, Paul. 
Oh, absolutely. Thank you for your expertise. Um, I'll, I'll address this uh, next question to, to Jason, and, and that is um, meteorology and weather conditions. Um, I know that you've flown in a number of challenging conditions, um, some of them up at high altitudes. Um, you know, Utah is, is one of those that comes to mind. Um, can you tell me about um, some of your experiences with weather and uh, what you consider safe and um, you know, do you have to wait sometimes several days to be able to fly when you've traveled great distances with your equipment? That kind of thing. Thanks, Paul. It's a it's a good question, and you know, uh, downtime is something nobody wants. Uh, but you know, crashing a drone is also something nobody wants. Uh, so it's a compromise. Uh, in terms of you know, flying at high altitudes, which we've done quite a lot of, um, you actually need to. Uh, change the propellers so you know you get half flying uh, propellers that actually give you a little bit more lift in those uh, the, the less dense air and so there are a number of factors I guess when you're flying probably probably, probably above um, 2,000 meters or so is you start to need to implement these higher propellers your flight time if you're getting 30, 30 minutes your flight time you're now down to probably about 20 um, and so those factors all need to be taken in, into account. Uh, in terms of high winds, uh, so when you're on the ground, um, the good rule of thumb that we use is we, uh, you know, besides your, an, uh, your anemometer um, doing the wind measurements, we look at the trees, we look at the, high, the tallest tree we can find. If it's, uh, if it's, you know, swaying in the wind significantly, we don't take off. Uh, because we just cannot predict what the weather is doing up at 2,000 feet. Um, you've got to look at the clouds. What are the clouds doing above that area? Um, uh, you know, so it's 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 a really strange thing that you might get to the site and it'd be too windy. But here's the thing. You have the full day to do those measurements and you will find a gap in the wind to be able to accomplish that mission. You know, the best time I'm finding for flights of these these types, and it's probably similar to the time when you fly, Paul, is just before sunset. Uh, the wind is calmed down uh, and you can get your half an hour window in there to get those, those drone based measurements. When it comes to rain, snow, we don't take off, right? We don't fly a drone in uh, uh, in weather that's going to compromise the integrity. You know, the manufacturer might say it's water resistant, um, but as our operational procedure, we don't fly in anything that's drizzle or rain or sleet. It's uh, 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 yeah, but you know, in in the uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of operations we've we've done, we've probably only ever had to postpone by a day or two a dozen times. So. So the weather, it, it affects us, but not as much as you'd think. Mm. What about the temperature um, and battery performance? Do you see a big uh, change with that? Yep. So you'll just lose, uh, on colder mornings, you know, uh, you just lose a little bit of flight time. Uh, there's no upper temperature limit. Um, we fly up to, you know, okay, here we go, metric 45 degrees Celsius, um, which I'm not sure it is in Fahrenheit. Um, so, but you got to ask yourself the question: If you're if you're at you know zero degrees, um, it, you know, do you need to be doing that flight right now? You know, is there potential of sleet? Is there potential of snow? Uh, you know, you try and optimize your conditions. You always, every time you take that drone off, you don't want to be compromised. You want to make sure that you're setting yourself up for success. If you feel that there's something that might go wrong, you've got to be professional enough to say, no, I'm not doing this flight. And if you're in Boston, you'd probably be waiting till June. <laughs> or, or worse, in Bozeman, Montana, I would say. What, what were the temperatures today uh, up there, Bill? We had a balmy negative 15 Fahrenheit this morning. Um, going for the high of one above. Um, but it gets better by the end of the week where it's negative 35 below at night and 15 for the high. That's, of course, Fahrenheit. Uh, not Celsius, but I guess you don't want to be flying in those conditions. Uh, no. no, I don't want to be outside <laughs> in those conditions. <laughs> um, I was also going to um, ask Bill about solar loading. I mentioned solar loading earlier in my presentation and the fact that we really want to fly for these thermal measurements um, during times after sunset or be before sunrise. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about solar loading and um, specifically um, in my application, um, how that may affect um, the signal to noise ratio of what I'm trying to show with uh, heating of um, broadcast components? If I've got a sun uh, beating down on the, um, on the transmission line, um, what kind of challenges is that going to present? And can we get around that by, um, you know, imaging during the day when it's um, fairly overcast and, uh, and evenly overcast without the sun shining? Um, any thoughts on that, Bill? Great question, Paul. Uh, solar loading is broke down into two basic, uh, two basic fields, solar absorption and solar reflection. Of course, it's dependent upon the material. If I have something copper, of course, that would be highly solar reflective. And what that does, Paul, is that's going to give us a false positive. So something might look like it is truly hot when it is a reflection off a component into the object we want to evaluate. And the way that we can maybe adjust for that is if we're flying an aircraft, we would simply change angle to different angles and different elevations above the component so that the camera has a chance to take different imagery. Uh, the other part is solar absorption. Solar load can affect the component. Let's say it is a black insulated wire. That solar load can be absorbed into that wire, of course, giving us another false positive. And, uh, Maybe it really isn't that hot. It, and that's why, you know, flying that uh, six degrees after after sunset, uh, that 30 minutes after civil sunset the FAA allows us is, is uh, the best time to fly probably. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Mm. And um, what about, uh, you know, we talked about misinterpreting the data and particularly with, um, you know, um, not understanding emissivity. Um, and for example, if there's a label on the transmission line, or if there are things that are going to affect um, the way the image looks, but not necessarily what's going on thermally there. Um, and, and there is a term, I, I can't remember what the name of the term, but um, overlaying the RGB image with the um, infrared image. Um, and many cameras have that feature. I think you know what I'm talking about. It's a three-letter acronym or a four-letter acronym. Um, you know, maybe you can comment a little bit about how, um, how important it is to make sure that we're looking at what we think we're looking at and not a reflection from a piece of tape or a label. Well, back to uh, the one factor you discussed was emissivity. So what is emissivity? It's just the efficiency by which a material can absorb and emit infrared radiation. And it's based on a scale from one to 99.99. So how efficient is that object at emitting radiation? And we have to determine that first, both qualitative and quantitatively. And of course, that might be difficult when you're 2000 feet in the air looking at something. So you have to kind of do some estimates and uh, that's going to determine, you know, what's the ability of that material to emit radiation or reflect radiation. And, you know, doing the overlay, like Paul mentioned, is I think is essential. I really do. And that can be done with a feature called multispectral dynamics or MSX, or there's also features in the software that allow you to overlay and combine the RGB or visual image with the infrared image, giving you a totally different look. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jason, uh, Paul, I, yeah, go ahead. John. I'm sorry. We do have a question if you'd like to take it. Absolutely. And it does happen to be for Jason. Um, and it says, uh, this is from Doug, um, elevation patterns vary between near field and far field. What distance is needed for far field? In a crowded site where a far field distance is difficult to achieve, how do you compensate? Yeah, it's one one of our challenges, Doug. And thanks for that question. And uh, you know what we found practically is that um, the far field is ideally where you want to be because that's where uh, the theoretical model says that's where you should be doing your elevation pattern. However, practically, we can get away with almost halving the far field to do that uh, that elevation pattern with 
very, very little compromise in the in the data. If you're on a on a, a really really crowded um, uh, site, uh, there are certain uh, and, and you can and you're only limited to say maybe a hundred feet. Uh, there are ways we can go around that, and that is by making use, I guess, of other sites in the area, and so potentially doing it at a lot further distance, like maybe two miles or three miles, uh, and and uh, doing that elevation pattern in an area where you can fly. Jason, I was going to ask you about the accuracy of um, your measurements. How do you ensure that you are getting good results rather than just uh, results that are coming in and you're you're just believing whatever you see? Yep, yep, uh, definitely, Paul. So you know we've got to understand that, uh, and uh, you guys would all agree with me that you know drones, the the, the toy perception is still there a little bit, but we're not dealing with a toy here. We're dealing with an engineered piece of equipment. The engineering involved in the drone is, is different to say the, the RF measurement system that we're putting on, on the drone. So when it comes to accuracy, you know, we're using, as you would calibrate your, your test instrument in the lab, we calibrate our test instrument on the drone. Uh, the spectrum analyzer is calibrated. Uh, our cables to the antennas are calibrated. They have known factors, they have known losses. Even our antennas themselves have known antenna factor calibration um, values associated with them. Uh, we also do electromagnetic modeling to see how far away we can mount that drone and where it, uh, that antenna on the drone to minimize the effect the drone has on the actual receive antenna pattern. Uh, so we can get a pure signal. So we don't want the drone affecting our signal at all. So you, you add all those things in combination, as well as you mentioned RTK, um, Paul, and one of the systems that we use in in, in our in the drone-based RF system is that we need RTK. We need that centimeter resolution of position. And so you add all of those things in together, and you're getting uh, what we uh, you're getting now an auditable trail of the uncertainty of your system and the accuracy of your system, you know, which is by far greater than any other system or method of measuring that is out there at the moment. And so we're getting accuracies in the order of one and a half to two dB, uh, whereas if you do it by land-based system, you're getting in the order of, you know, it could be four to six dB in accuracies, which is a large amount um, to be able to try and prove anything about an antenna. So I hope, I hope that that kind of helps you there with that question, Paul. Yeah, and usually you provide that uh, all that uh, data, that assurance data to the client. Definitely, there's a whole uncertainty uh, table in the in the in the back of the report uh, with the with the calibration factors in it. Um, so the audit trail is there. Great, great. Yeah. Joel, do we have anything in the queue? We have no questions in the queue at this time. I do have a question for Paul. Go ahead, Bill. Thank you. So, Paul, I have never flown a broadcast tower for evaluation. However, you have, and thank you for the images. Um, they're very interesting, especially off something that might be quite reflective. It takes a good pilot to do that, a good interpreter. So do you think that using a thermography on a drone um, would maybe replace a tower inspection by somebody actually having to climb the tower? Thanks for that question, Bill. That's a good question. Um, and the answer is no. Uh, what I do think um, we can do with this is um, make it more cost effective for operators to get a better picture of what's going on on their tower. Um, the drone has a lot of advantages, as I pointed out in my presentation, over getting a human to climb up the tower. I mean, we can do it in more flexible conditions. Um, if it's really the weather conditions are not conducive for a person to climb a tower, if it's icy, cold, windy, those kind of things, you can still get a drone up there. Um, but um, there's no question about the human factor is going to be something that is always there. A drone can't fix something. A drone can't tighten a bolt or, you know, figure out if a bolt is loose. Um, but we can fly more frequently and do it less expensively and um, 
you know, get a closer tab on actually what's happening dynamically on the tower so that if we do need to hire a crew to go up there, um, we can do it for a good reason and not just for um, a, a general inspection. Although general inspections, like I say, a drone can't do everything. So I don't think it's going to replace um, humans ever. <laughs> but uh, but it is it is a great tool that we have with this with this new technology. Joel, if there are no questions in the queue, what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you, is to go back to my presentation and uh, just show a couple of the RGB images um, that I didn't get a chance to during uh, during my part. Uh, of course, and just as a time check, we have about seven minutes. I will go ahead and uh, go back to that presentation. Uh, okay, well, uh, if there are no other questions, I wanted to take the last few minutes to touch on um, some of the other applications which are not um, d directly thermal related, although this one is. This is an example of a transmission line. Um, uh, it's, I believe it's an eight inch transmission line inside a building that was used with a um, handheld camera. And, um, you know, stretching the image um, in FLIR tools, you can definitely see the uh, temperature gradients and where the um, uh, Teflon insulators are inside there. This is um, this is a great tool to find out if there's something going on um, inside there. Um, I, I wanted to show a couple of images from the um, Z30 camera, which is that camera with the optical zoom. Um, just as an example to see how close you know you can get with the gyroscopically stabilized camera and that 30 times zoom um, as you can see in the upper left hand corner we have a beacon at about 500 feet above the ground and you can actually read the barcode on the uh, the beacon and tell whether any of the bolts are loose or anything is going on there um, same thing with this uh, fm antenna bay below it you can take a look at the hose clamps and make sure that they're in place. And um, a, guy wire, a guy wire attach point, um, again, on the right here, you can see that the um, cotter pin is not rusted and, and in place there. Um, this is, uh, you know, some close-up work um, on the top of a tower um, where a pole attaches to the tower structure. Um, and again, you can see on the right-hand side here, this bolt um, is uh, is clearly in place and tightened down. Something um, just to demonstrate some of the higher resolution images you can get um, using a drone, even on a windy day. Um, these pictures here uh, show um, uh, again some RGB images. On the right, you can see where the tower crew put some electrical tape on. And, uh, you know, the client recognized that and said, hey, we, we're not happy with that installation. Why don't you make it more permanent? Something that, nece that necessarily would have been obvious to the, uh, the client um, uh, unless he had these, these images. Um, and then my conclusion slide here was, uh, you know, talking about the fact that drone can be used in many cases to perform the, the visual and infrared imaging of antennas and towers, and as Jason has talked about, also um, making uh, important signal measurements. Um, again, you need someone that's properly certified for piloting, um, and the airspace requirements uh, are somewhat limiting, but uh, they can always uh, or nearly always get be gotten around. Um, so um, again, utilizing these drones for the intermediate tower inspections will enhance the overall safety and lower the inspection costs. So um, there we go. I just wanted to get to those slides. Um, and uh, we probably have a couple of minutes left. Uh, so I will turn it back over to Joel. If there's anything else that anybody wants to talk about, um, we're here. Um, please reach out to any of us um, if you have any questions that come up after this. Uh, this session today, we're, we're all happy to, to talk about it. Thank you. Very good. And um, there are no questions in the queue at the moment. Um, I think uh, I would like to uh, just um, remind folks that uh, this is the first of two Pulse events that will be occurring this year. Um, we will have one later in the year in, in July. I have a slide on that. Uh, and uh, I'd also like to uh, remind folks that 
um, our sponsors are the ones who make it possible for us to bring uh, IEEE BTS Pulse to you. And so thank you very much to uh, ERI, HDMI, Dielectric, Alive Telecom, Alan Dick, Jam Pro, and ATSC. Um, they uh, are very, very generous in supporting the education efforts of BTS and the industry. So this is uh, day two, uh, thermal imaging theory. Uh, tomorrow, you will uh, have a presentation on 5G content production. And so I hope you will join us there. Uh, and uh, with that, um, unless I'm forgetting something, I would like to thank uh, Paul, uh, Bill, and Jason for your presentations and thank our guests for spending some time with us today. I know there are a lot of online educational opportunities out there, and so uh, being uh, part of this one is, is greatly appreciated. So uh, thank you for uh, spending that time with us. And with that, we shall call it a day, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much, everybody. Take care, stay safe, and Bill, stay warm. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>